everyone. I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. I'm really happy to be here for week 11 of pivoting during the pandemic. And our um, focus today is on new tools and techniques. And we have a really unique um, focus today and I'm really happy about it. Today we're going to talk about opportunities. And some of you have had questions about what do you do in order to like get started how, what kind of programs are out there to help you, and also what kind of funding, what kind of partnerships are available, and, and are there any programs that will help you with the commercialization? So I'm really happy to be able to introduce our, our presenters today. So we are very happy to have um, Brent Kisling, who's the Executive Director of the Oklahoma Department of Commerce. And we also have Devin Reeves, Energy and Economic Mission in the Government of Israel. And we have David Ephraim, who's also with the Government of Israel. And we also have Amy Henry, Unique Ventures in Houston. And we have um, Don Herman, who has a, a technology that he will be showing us. And finally, I'd like to introduce um, Larry Davis, who's a professor of economics at Texas A&M and Texarkana. So welcome, everyone. Curiosity, what time is it in Israel? <laughs> um, I think it's what? I think it's, well, last time we started at, we had a presenter and it was seven o'clock here, it was 3 a.m. there. So that was pretty challenging. <laughs> okay. But, I, uh, uh, but we're lucky that Devin and David are, are headquartered in, in Houston. So they're, oh, they're not, in, they're not in Israel. <laughs> no, they're oh, in Texas. <laughs> okay, okay, good deal. So anyway, so anyway, uh, well, I wanted you to maybe say a few words, uh, Larry. So would you like to? Um, well, I'm just happy to be here again this week. I looked at the roster of presenters. They seem exciting, and uh, it's always interesting. So I'm looking forward to see what the presenters have to present tonight. <laughs> great. Well, great. So um, why don't we get started? And what I'll do is I'll stop sharing my screen. And I will turn the floor over to um, Brent Kisling, if you'd like to introduce yourself and also share some slides. I, uh, I don't have any slides this evening. You're okay. just going to be stuck with me. I hope that's all right. Uh, that's perfect. I, uh, it, it seems like any time I try to share a screen and use, uh, use slides, it always fails on me. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll just go this way tonight. And, it, it's so good to uh, to be with all of you. It's an honor to have been asked to speak to this incredible group from all across the country. And, and uh, uh, just for purposes of introduction, I am the executive director for the Oklahoma Department of Commerce. I work with our governor, uh, Governor Kevin Stitt, who many of you might have saw. He was the first governor uh, that um, tested positive for COVID. Uh, just announced that this afternoon. Fortunately, he's asymptomatic and uh, uh, his wife has tested negative, the kids have tested negative. In fact, all of his staff uh, today uh, or yesterday had gotten tested and, and all of them have come back negative. So I don't know whether he just doesn't breathe whenever he's around people, but uh, uh, anyway, he, he did test positive the last couple of days. Um, a couple of quick things. First of all, uh, the, the big thing in Oklahoma, right now is we are 17 days away from the Oklahoma City Thunder playing again. And that is very important because uh, really COVID began in, in earnest in America, in Oklahoma City and here in Oklahoma, because on March the 11th, that's whenever Oklahoma City Thunder were playing the Utah Jazz and a guy named Rudy Gobert, who was a player for the Jazz, tested positive. And uh, we were there that evening with the governor. We were hosting a company that, uh, that night and uh, they canceled the Thunder game, and then they canceled all of the games for that evening about 15 minutes later, and then by the next morning, the, the uh, NBA season was over, and then baseball followed. It, it was just an avalanche after that. Um, but even though, even though things really began in Oklahoma City, uh, I would suggest that Oklahoma really hasn't faced the, uh, uh, the issue with COVID that some of the other states have. Uh, we've had a total of 432 deaths in Oklahoma, which we mourn every one of those, but compared to some of the other states, uh, we have been very fortunate in that area. And, and of those who have passed, uh, their average age is 75 years old. About 80% of them have been in long-term care facilities. 
And so really we've been able to focus in a specific direction. Uh, we've got 561 people today that are in the hospital and, and we've got about 5,000 beds that are available. And the, the reason why I mention all of that is because uh, that has given us an opportunity in Oklahoma to focus on our business community in, uh, and uh, those in oil and gas, which have also taken a huge hit. Uh, all of you, uh, just in the last several months, really you were taking a hit before, um, before it was cool. I mean, before March hit and, and COVID hit. Um, but uh, uh, one thing that we did way early in this process is we needed to ramp up on the amount of PPE that we had in Oklahoma. And <clears throat> our health department was needing to make millions of dollars worth of purchases and didn't have a connection really to the manufacturers uh, within our state. And so they used us at the Department of Commerce and we created a directory of those companies in Oklahoma that made masks, that made hand sanitizer, that made uh, gowns for, uh, for nurses. And we had identified about six 64, 65 companies that made them, but there were a lot of them, a lot of our manufacturers that saw an opportunity and started to pivot into this space as well, which is really what we're talking about tonight. And one thing we did in Oklahoma, and there's been a couple of other states that have done it as well, is we were able to ramp up very quickly what we called a manufacturing reboot program. And we did 38 grants for about $150,000 each uh, to manufacturers to help them purchase equipment or train people in order to pivot into this space. And the reason why that worked so well is then we were able to keep those dollars in Oklahoma. We knew we were spending millions of dollars on PPE, but we wanted to keep the dollars home. So we, uh, uh, we created this directory and then our, our curve started to flatten in Oklahoma we started to reopen some of our businesses actually on April 24th is whenever we started to reopen in our state. And by June 1st, we were completely reopened with all of our businesses again. Um, but we realized that as places of worship opened and as restaurants opened and, and uh, in many of, of your states, this is going to happen as well. All of those businesses have to purchase PPE as well. And so we took this directory that we had just established for the health department and we turned it around to the public. And now it's got around 120, 130 uh, Oklahoma manufacturers in it um, who, have, who have come into this space in order to provide uh, PPE for anybody. And I don't know of a lot of other states that have it. You can go to okcommerce.gov to actually see uh, what this portal looks like. It fluctuates from day to day because there are some, uh, some that have just been completely overwhelmed and asked us to take them off of the directory until they could catch up. Uh, and, and others have continued to hire people in order to support that, uh, uh, that industry. But a couple in particular, uh, Susan had asked me to, to come up with some specific examples. Uh, we had one company in Southern Oklahoma down in Paul's Valley called Covercraft, a very innovative company with some great uh, innovative uh, owners and they made auto covers. So if you have a, a nice Jaguar that you have parked out on the street and you want a, a uh, something to go over the top of it to protect it or uh, or one of those that just go over the front of the car or over your dash they make all of those types of covers and they pivoted almost immediately and used one of our grants in order to switch to making masks and gowns and anything that would be made out of cloth in order to support the the healthcare industry they've since started switching back they still make a few of these items but they began switching back to what they were doing but because of that they were able to maintain their employment through the whole time uh, they actually added some employees uh, at times. So uh, a, a very good success story down in Southern Oklahoma. And then another one also in Southern Oklahoma down in the Lawton area is a company called Specialty Cosmetics. It's owned by uh, a lady, actually former Marine, a lady that uh, her name's Jennifer Ellis. And uh, she has, uh, uh, that's a third generation female owned company that makes um, typically has made personal hygiene products. So soaps and shampoos and, and that kind of thing. But it's a, it's a, she's a chemist. It's a chemistry project that she has going on there. But as soon as this hit, she switched over completely to hand sanitizer. And uh, we were able to help her out with a grant as well uh, to purchase some equipment, some bottling equipment uh, that she needed to switch over into. She's actually still in that space and hasn't moved back at this point. I know she's hired at least 20 people additional into her uh, into her factory 
Um, and then and then another pivot that we're seeing as well, which is not necessarily in the healthcare space, but we're seeing it more in the oil and gas space um, because of the fluctuations we've seen over the last several months. Uh, you might have seen that Oklahoma has been competing, Tulsa, Oklahoma has been competing with Austin, Texas for the next Tesla plant to, uh, to make the, the Cybertruck. And I don't know whether we're going to win that or not. There's probably gonna be an announcement uh, very soon, maybe this evening or tomorrow. Uh, but uh, whether we win it or lose the deal, we're getting a lot of attention from this area of the country for auto manufacturing. And I really think that's probably moving more to the central part of the United States anyway. And we're seeing a lot of our oil and gas manufacturers already starting to get into this space. They're not, they're not leaving oil and gas behind, um, but they're, they're starting to make some of these products for the automobile industry. A lot of the equipment is the same. A lot of the training of staff is the same. And uh, um, so it, we have seen that change as well. And then the last thing I will mention, and Susan, I, I don't know if we're doing question and answer or, or yeah, anything yeah, like that, but I know our time is limited. Um, many of you are probably wondering, okay, what kinds of resources are available? The, the grant programs that I talked about that we created in Oklahoma are very specific to Oklahoma. And we used Oklahoma dollars in order to do that. Um, but we also led a communication strategy with our businesses in our state to make sure they were connected to the federal resources that were specifically coming out of the CARES Act. And uh, <clears throat> I hope that everybody participated in the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, that was a huge program, huge benefit, basically to allow you to continue to pay your payroll for, for two months. Uh, that program still has dollars in it. You apply for it through your bank. And uh, uh, there's still hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. That's in billions of dollars. They're still in that program. Uh, so, uh, and and even though it started as a paycheck protection program, it has since morphed a little bit into allowing you to use additional dollars. It's a forgivable loan that you get through your lender. Uh, the IDLE program, the uh, uh, stands for something. Uh, basically, the SBA uh, disaster loan program. That one has run out of money recently, but every once in a while they find some more dollars to put back into it. Since it is a loan program, as dollars are paid back into it, they can reopen the portal and, and you can apply for it. It's a 30 year working capital uh, loan um, and you can defer the payments for a while up front, but uh, it's a great additional capital source. And then the other big program that's out there right now that we're not seeing a lot of traction from in Oklahoma is uh, called the Main Street Loan Program. It's for much larger loans. The, the minimum loan on that's $250,000. You can go all the way up to millions of dollars. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a five-year loan with two years of payments deferred. Um, it's just an awfully quick amortization schedule in order to, to pay those dollars back. Uh, but we are seeing some of our oil and gas companies that were really needing an, an influx of capital uh, taking advantage of that in Oklahoma. And then the last thing that I will mention, <clears throat> that I, I uh, that Susan had mentioned, some of you are, are international, and so this wouldn't wouldn't pertain to you, but for sure everybody in the United States, um, the CARES Act included some money that was allotted to every state, and it's called Coronavirus Relief Funds. If you're not familiar with that, you need to familiarize yourself with it, because every state got an allocation. Oklahoma got 1.5 billion dollars, which in Oklahoma is a lot of money. Uh, and those dollars can be used for only three things. It can be used for reimbursement of state agencies for coronavirus uh, um, responses. So think about um, you know, like your unemployment office, your health department, you doing uh, uh, tracking and contact tracking, that kind of thing. We, we used our National Guard to go out and do some sanitation in our uh, nursing home. So that kind of thing gets, uh, uh, gets reimbursed. But that's the first thing, reimbursement of state agencies. Second one is for reimbursement to local governments, uh, cities, counties, um, any of those COVID related expenses uh, with the same box around it as what the state has to do. But the third one is economic assistance. And it, it has to go to businesses that were negatively affected by COVID and that's a pretty easy thing to prove for most businesses nowadays. You, you just show some kind of reduction in revenue over the last several months as compared to 2019. 
Every state is administering those dollars a little bit differently. We've been analyzing each state and, and crafting our own programs. Um, the big one that we had was an Oklahoma Business Relief Program. We put $100 million toward this. Um, uh, we used uh, uh, you, you, we used our lenders, so the businesses had to go to their lender, and the lender actually applied on their behalf. That way, we could get dollars out more quickly. You had to prove a 25% reduction in, in revenues, uh, and then we maxed all of the grants out at $25,000. So it was really for smaller businesses. Uh, we're seeing a lot of states do something similar to that. Sometimes they use lenders, and sometimes they don't. But uh, we're now looking at probably in August using some of those dollars to help get our daycare centers reopened. Uh, maybe use some of them for helping our nonprofits because they are getting hammered right now and having to deal with all the social services issues. Um, but for many of you in, in business and industry as well, there's probably going to be something coming out of every state out of those dollars uh, that would be there to assist you. And, and most of the time it's gonna be coming through a Department of Commerce. It, all the dollars go to the governors and they make the decision on how the dollars will be spent. Um, so if you've got a relationship with your governor or with your uh, secretaries of commerce, I would certainly reach out and, and see how they're spending it in, in your state. Um, we, like I said at the beginning, we truly believe that now is the time to, uh, to be ramping up our economy again. It's uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> I've been comparing it to, again to basketball. I think it's a three on one fast break right now for states that are that have not been as negatively affected by COVID as others. And so it's a very competitive market out there. We have more companies in our pipeline right now of projects looking to move to Oklahoma than we've ever had. Uh, and, and so uh, um, we want to make sure that businesses are, are taken care of. So Susan, I hope that's uh, helpful in some way is uh, if you have any oh, questions. Absolutely. I can answer. Well, I, I really appreciate the, the thorough uh, view of what, what resources are available and how they've been used. I, I, one thing that strikes me as, as extremely useful is the idea to sort of have multiple pivots at the same time so that using the, the pivoting to be able to have uh, multiple sources of income, multiple capabilities, not that you'll be doing all of, them, all of them at the same time, but to be able to respond well, and the other thing that we're seeing that I didn't mention is that everybody is looking to shorten their supply chain right now. Yes. Um, a great example that we had in Oklahoma, we've, we have a big company down in Norman that Susan's probably familiar with, Johnson Controls. They make HVAC units. And at the very beginning of this, pro this uh, pandemic in New York City, whenever they were ramping up all of those mobile uh, healthcare facilities in Central Park and all around, um, they were, uh, uh, they needed HVAC units and they were purchasing those from Norman, Oklahoma. Well, Johnston's has facilities all around the world and they had one factory in Mexico that made one component, just a very small component that went in the HVAC units, but that area of Mexico was shut down because of the pandemic. And so they couldn't get that component to go in their HVAC unit to deliver it to New York. So we had, we worked with uh, Secretary of State's office in DC uh, Secretary of Commerce, uh, Ross, worked with him as well, and we're able to get that factory reopened so we could continue uh, that supply chain. You're seeing the same thing in the processing of proteins right now with cattle and, and hogs and, and chickens. Wow. Um, well, I'll, I'll, want I'll follow up with you. Chain. Yeah, because um, we've had a couple of people that have been expanding into additives manufacturing, and uh, especially with the the um, taking the point of like which ones are really really effective to do metal 3d printing which parts so it, you know some people argue that it's a little bit expensive but it's worse to be out of, um, shut down for, for months right but that's really interesting about Johnson control and and the other and the so in the in the case of of manufacturing, that goes into agricultural processing. Do you see any oil and gas companies kind of pivoting into that because they, they might have mixing equipment, things like that? You know, we, uh, we haven't seen that in Oklahoma. Uh, again, we've been pretty fortunate in our protein processing that we haven't had any facilities closed down yet. Now we have had some some of that accordion effect uh, where there's had to be animals euthanized because there just wasn't mm -hmm. a market for them. 
and that's so unfortunate. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, we and we did have some over the last several years, some oil and gas companies that have looked more into the agricultural uh, uh, equipment manufacturing and that kind of thing. But I, I, I will tell you, as as bad as things are in oil and gas right now, they're they're almost equally as bad in, in agriculture, at least in our state. Uh, we the prices there are just uh, they're not negative numbers like. Uh, <laughs> Like West, West Texas Intermediate, but uh, uh, but they, they got pretty low and they haven't really bounced back yet. Is that uh, due to the supply chain again and the inability to export? Yep. The, well, the the inability to um, to process ag commodities. Uh, there's a there's a bottleneck right now with the processing facilities, and so the the raw commodity out in the field is mm -hmm. just not. Okay. Okay. Well, wow. it's really interesting. Well, my folks, I grew up on a, I grew up driving a tractor every day. My dad used to always kid that we only had to work half days from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. <laughs> I remember spending summers near a dairy farm. I became afraid of dairy, dairy cattle. <laughs> they follow you. <laughs> anyway, they're big too. <laughs> anyway, so, well, thank you so much. This is really, really interesting and, and, We'll share your contact information and, and I'll definitely follow up and um, hopefully we'll, we'll really see some, some dynamic um, action plans. Perfect. Yeah. If you want to put my email into the chat box, I uh, would love to answer any questions anybody has. Okay. The state of Oklahoma, we're always, uh, always loving to answer those questions. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Susan. So I really appreciate that and our, our next presenter is um, is um, Devin Reeves, an Energy and Economic Mission, Government of Israel. And this was uh, another huge opportunity for partnerships, et cetera. So Devin, you want to share your screen? And... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want right. to start off by saying thank you. And hi, everyone. I'm glad to see that Oklahoma is doing good. Um, my name is Devin Reeves, and I am from the Energy and Economic Mission down in Houston, Texas. So um, we are, you know, kind of the COVID capital right now. Uh, but <laughs> I've been home for the past couple of days. I've been feeling a little under the weather. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, no temperature, but still feeling something. Mm. So uh, by all means, I am honored to be here. So I really want to thank you for putting all this together. And uh, yeah, if I could share my screen. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, so here we go. Well, our, um, our, our positive thoughts and prayers go out to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Here you join go. our governor. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Right. Yeah. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I want to talk about the Israeli opportunity. Uh, so since 1948, um, Israel has been a little scrapper in the game. Um, as you can see, 8.5 million population. Um, they're kind of surrounded by a lot of enemies, but they have always been, you know, on the front line of technology as far as figuring out, you know, what's the best way to make a bad situation good. So absolutely genius in every sense. As you can see, the annual GDP, uh, GDP per capita, uh, continuously, it's good on the global sense. Uh, let's see. But as far as Israel, you know, they are big leader in the world of innovation. So as you can see from Bloomberg to IMD to the World Economic Forum, we're at the top. So as far as our mission, we are pretty much a conduit to Israeli technology. So we offer uh, alternate energies, um, artificial intelligence-based systems for monitoring oil and gas and utilities. Uh, we are at the top for water technology. We're the global leader in energy, solar technology, and also water treatment uh, in life sciences and biotechnology. As you can see, we're number one in startups per capita, number one in PhDs per capita, number one in patent applications per capita, and number one in VC investments per capita. So 
a lot of the world, you know, invest in Israeli technology because they know there's definite, um, there's a definite win-win situation with all countries putting into Israel. Um, as far as research and development, as you can see, the biggest names in the world are part of Israeli's economy. So from Microsoft to Google, eBay, Cisco, IBM, the top technology companies are in Israel because they know that the best technology is coming out of there. Uh, so one of the big challenges uh, for Israel is water. So as you can see, 60% of Israel's land is desert. Um, Israel now enjoys only half the amount of rain it had when found in 1948. And Israel leads the world in water recycling as it's able to recycle 86% 86, 86 of its water. Um, and like I said, the closest country is Spain at 17%. So they are top notch as far as water technology. I know I'm not a geologist, but I know I'm surrounded by some really fantastic minds that are into water technology. So Israel is definitely a place to look into as far as investing and putting your time and research into uh, who has the best minds in water tech. Now, as you can see here, natural water resources, you know, um, they don't have a lot of water, but they are able to make it work for the entire country, which is a technological breakthrough that they were able to figure out, you know, being positioned with a lot of problems, they were able to figure out the solutions. Now, just quick fun facts. I didn't even know this. I just looked this up. 15,400 liters just to make one kilogram of beef. I mean, I ate a burger yesterday and I had to think about, oh my God, like how much water really went into that uh, feeding the cows, feeding the cattle, and where does that come from? 400,000 liters you know, of water just to build a car, 130 liters of water just to make one cup of coffee. I mean, these are the things that we don't really think about too much, but um, Israeli government and you know, great minds over there were able to figure these things out to make their economy work. As we can see, wastewater treatment, 95% is being treated. 86% is being reused. So they are a global leader in wastewater treatment. Um, like I said before, you know, you could see as far as compared to other big countries, Israel is at the top for water retreatment and the reuse of water throughout their nation. Um, desalinate, desalination, which is another big thing as far as reusing the, uh, the seawater that they had, 80% of the water consumption, which is a huge thing. And then I'll move to cybersecurity. Another wonderful thing um, Israel is at the forefront from. So I deal with life sciences, biotechnology, and also cybersecurity. So I have a lot of clients um, that are on the top of the technological scale. So as you can see, um, internationally, $75 billion in 2015, as far as used into the international cyber market, that's going up to 170 billion this year. Um, incident response, intelligence, mobile security, and cloud security. Uh, these are just a few areas in which Israel really prevails uh, one company that I'm dealing with right now actually deals with the security in companies that are producing their products, but before they hit to market, uh, they install the security, which allows them to be safe and not hacked, and they run through the entire life cycle of the actual product. So there's a lot of different um, areas in which cybersecurity can be um, intertwined with a lot of projects that people are working on right now and Israel is one of the best hubs to go to. So next we can see banking, finance, critical infrastructure, government, military, and Intel, enterprise, IoT, and mobile are just some of the things that Israel really, you know, 
uh, is in the forefront as far as cybersecurity. Now we can move to, there's plenty of uh, explanation, well, examples of different uh, cybersecurity hacks, different problems that are going on in Israel really shines when it comes to taking on these uh, problems. Now, one thing I want to really highlight on is the Bird Foundation from Israel. So the Binational Industrial Research and Development. They are a product of Israel working with the US government. So they actually, let me show you, they provide up to a million dollars uh, in grants, don't have to pay them back, for bilateral work between Israel and the US. So if you wanna do research and development, um, you just apply with the Bird Foundation. If they approve, they'll write a check up to a million dollars to pretty much support the US and Israel working together in order to produce new technologies coming out to the rest of the world. Um, so our team, Shai, um, he is our attache. Uh, we have Vanessa Scobie who deals with energy and partnerships. Uh, we have David Ephraim, who is actually another geologist as well. So he would be able to answer any geology questions that we have. And myself, I'm the director of innovation partnerships, and I deal mostly with life sciences, biotechnology, and cybersecurity as well. And um, here's my contact information. By all means, I would be happy to introduce you to the rest of our team and our staff and facilitate any other uh, like uh, collaborations with any of the great Israeli clients that we have with our American partners as well. Oh, wow, this is really exciting. Wonderful opportunities. Well, I, I know you, you just, um, touch the tip of the iceberg yeah and um yeah i can definitely go into more details uh i'd be more than honored if you could share my contact information with everybody and i would be happy to follow up with not only you susan but everybody mm -hmm. else so that we can get closer and figure out how we can develop great partnerships together absolutely wow this is, this is great well i really really appreciate it Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I'll definitely share your um, in information and the, I'll have a follow-up um, email to everyone, which will include a recording. And also when I upload the recording onto YouTube, I'll put the show notes, basically the agenda. And, and also um, I'm assuming everybody can always e contact you through LinkedIn too. Absolutely. That's great. Well, thank you, Susan. Well, thank you. and. Um, Hope you start feeling better. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, thank you. And um, that was great. And that's a good segue to our, our next presenter, Amy Henry. And she's going to talk about her um, work with um, Unique Ventures. And I, I'd like to also just take a moment to recognize Unique Ventures. You might have noticed on our, on our um, uh, cover and our slide we had our um, our opening slide we have a, um, a logo and it's unique ventures and that is because unique ventures is a sponsor and they're sponsoring us in our series and also a new pitch at your tech which starts monday so welcome amy oh yes great perfect hopefully you can see this i i do i'm i I think we've been working too. I feel under the weather too, as well. So I was. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I'll take care. Oh, I tell you, it's uh, really going on, and it, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a good segue because um, at Unique Ventures, you know, we spoke last time. You know, we we our partners are are Equinor Hess and Technip FMC. It's um, we work across the energy value chain, and the thrust of our model is is starting with, you know, providing paid field trials and pilots for technology companies. Um, and that's kind of the thrust of it because we work from anywhere to, to early stage startup all the way to past series Bs. And then we work with Vanessa over, and, and, and I know Shay as well, over the Israeli uh, trade organization. 
So, you know, and, and so they've been done a good job on trying to promote the bird program and, you know, what a great resource is, Israel is for some of their, you know, a lot of their technology that they have. So, you know, kind of to talk about, I guess, you know, pivoting and, and the changing times. And that's really one thing that, that we've been working on. We worked, we worked on this last year already. This is not something new. But it's, it's part of, you know, how do you create the runway for startups and, and the technology and the innovation that, that goes, goes hand in hand? Um, you know, besides, you know, working on the proof of concept and, and, and learning how to do things differently, it's then trying to create um, this runway for innovation, right? And that's really when it comes to our work that we've been doing with the trade organizations as well. So that's been really, really important. So we work hand in hand with the Canadian Trade Organization, um, the Israeli Trade Organization, um, Business France, um, and through many other measures. So, you know, why, why Israel is interesting for, for, for energy companies is it, it, they're not looking for energy tech, you know, specifically they're looking for some of the emerging and maybe game changing or novel technology. So they're not interested per se in really going there and setting up a large R&D center, right? It, it's looking at how, how can I create a global sourcing hub for technology and create that, that bridge, you know, say between the U.S. and, and Israel, right? Um, it might be in biotech, it might be in military, like you say, cybersecurity. Um, and, and you really don't have a lot of what I call true energy companies within you know, Israel, they've got a lot of the Fortune 500 and the big names, but energy really hasn't had a presence. So it's, it's finding a way that we can, you know, have an exchange, kind of an exchange program to some extent to, you know, link up the, the expertise that we have here in, in North America and the States um, with some of these budding technologies. Um, because you have to, a lot of them will be starting outside of energy, right? So then you have to do this whole translation process, you know, getting a value proposition that's really going to make sense for energy companies, um, you know, getting a, a business use case developed. Um, and this also includes clean tech as well. So then, you know, our, our program has now been extended to clean tech and, and new business energies as well. So, you know, on this big, big slide with a lot of information here, um, besides just doing the pilots, it really is finding those internal structures within the companies, you know, and then increasing the, the, the involvement of those tra trade organizations. And, and it runs two ways. You know, a lot of our own people or startups that we deal with, they, they forget about, there, there are a lot of good pilot opportunities or, you know, considerations to go up to Canada as well. Um, and, and then Canada also has an, a program with, with Israel as well. So you have the Berg program and then and Canada, Canada has, has another one. So it's, it's looking at cross ecosystems. So, you know, even if we have startups here, it may make sense, sense for them to, you know, kind of eventually stat, establish themselves in Canada or, or, or Norway or, or some other international place. Um, so, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm throwing Nesh up here a bit because, you know, people, we have a lot of conversations with startups, right? And, you know, they, they really focus on, oh, I, I have to get a really large paid field trial, a large pilot. You know, that's gonna help me um, become a, a commercial success. Um, and they look at that value of that field trial. And that really kind of is not the case. So. When this started with, with us, they already started a pilot with Pioneer. So we work outside of our model. And then they did a pilot for Equinor on kind of, I think this is some of their flow back analysis. And then they did a, a different pilot on their, their commercial stack with Hess. Then they went back to Equinor, um, did some uh, piloting over in Norway on corporate strategy, um, and then another one. And then from this process, you know, of these, I call like mini pilots and, and stacks that they did. Um, if you look at their funnel of all the new, new opportunities, they probably have 30 or 40 companies that there were, you know, have very kind of high defined business use cases. And it's not just an upstream, 
you know, um, it's, it's looking at, that's where they started. They were ex-petroleum engineers. So now it's, you know, we've had discussions with LNG side of the business, um, midstream. Um, we've had discussions with New York with uh, financial markets um, and financial analysts. So really this is kind of the springboard, you know, getting this. Uh, and so if you look at what becomes then kind of your go-to market strategy is, you know, that first phase, you're, you, you focus on more of the medium companies in that early stage. And then you kind of have a kind of a middle tranche here. And, and this is, I mean, it's digital. It's very different when you talk about hard science, but it is some of the same approach because the adoption process, even for a digital company is extremely complicated because of the long standing issues kind of of getting IT approvals within an organization. So it's, it's looking at scaling up with different industries at the same time and then going through this maturation process. Um, so really it's first starting what we do is, is kind of the proof of concept, you know, working with companies, even we work with Israeli companies and, and Canadian companies, it's getting them to understand, you know, are you really moving the needle um, for the energy companies, helping them define what does a success look like, you know, finding and designing the right pilot right? We're looking for, for more strategic pilots, smaller, right? But more rapid instead of a, you know, typical kind of three to six month pilot. Um, I've, we've had conversations. I've got Canadian companies that we're working with that they're probably not going to be ready for a, a field trial for another year. But so we're working with them, um, on that long lead time, even though they're not ready, it's, it's worth the time and effort so that when they become ready, um, we'll work with them over the next year until they get to that point in time. Um, I thought, and really the, the whole issue is kind of this adoption, you know, this, this, this valley of death. Um, in terms of, you know, designing these pilots, like I said, small and fast, and, you know, and this is also why we're working with the trade organizations when, when the companies are coming over here, right, is really trying to, some of them may need to be teamed up or, or learn from some other technology companies that are complementary. Um, so they understand kind of how the decision makers look at their particular technology. Um, and so they understand the, the MOC that has to happen, which is the management change. And that's the reason why adoption takes so long. Um, in the industry, they, people just don't, don't realize, I mean, people even from the industry may just be working in, in a very specific area, but when it comes to adoption, not understanding all of the changes, they have, there'll be governance changes. There'll probably be IT and security changes that come with that technology. Are you displacing people um, by way of adoption? Then you have get into all the, the I, I call the, the people and the soft aspects. Well, well, I've known this vendor or, you know, I've always used this tool, right? You know, yeah, there could be something better, but, you know, we don't even like to go in a room and sit in a different place, right? Um, <laughs> you know, you notice if you go somewhere, you, you always you know, you kind of get mad at someone because they sat in the place that you always sit, right? I mean, we're, we're creatures of habit. Um, and so, all, you know, and there's disruption within an organization, right? So, you know, it's, it's all of these things that you have to factor into that equation. I just put this up here and kind of talking to kind of like the bottom picture where you see the the mind. I think this one actually came from McKinsey, if I'm not mistaken. You know, all the social factors, the organizational, the cognitive factors that go into all of this. Um, really, I, I would have to say energy is probably the, one of the toughest verticals um, to go through adoption, to tell you the truth. It, it really does take a long time. Um, and, and really, you know, we, we, we try to look at you know, because we do health checks in all our, our companies and, and the startups that we work with. Um, whether we work with them or not, they check from us if they, you know, you know, want to try to, to become part of the program. So they can have an indication from, from other operators or service providers kind of how they view um, their technology, right? And it goes from 
you know, do, they, do we think it's scalable? Do they have a market strategy, the commercialization of the team? Um, you know, do they understand, you know, kind of what does their pilot have to look like? A lot of companies come and, and they, they're ready to do a pilot. And so we say, okay, talk to us about what does that pilot look like for you? And usually there's some silence in the room, right? Because <laughs> we haven't really thought about that that far. Um, we look at technology roadmaps, research. I mean, these are all the questions that, you know, your eventual customers are going to be asking, really. And, um, you know, so this is, goes to the whole thing about having the roadmap, scale at the right pace, pivot team with industry. And, and I would encourage anyone, I think really this is the right time. You've got either people that have, you know, retired or, or people who have been displaced. Um, you have lots of experts and, and you know, our, our you know, energy folks are very tightly connected. Our network is, it's, it's a big, big community, but be surprised how small it really is. Um, mistake i see companies you know we work with all the programs like mass challenge and generator in houston you know we work with a lot of different programs and whether they're energy related or not um but i see a lot of mistake companies are going especially the younger startups as they jump from one innovation space to another i see the same ones over and over again right and you know it's great that you can get your, your value proposition, you get a, a, a kind of a high level pitch deck, but really you need to work with some really experienced, um, sometimes deeply technical people from the industry, right? So, you know, this is why we're working with trade organizations is, is we need to have something hardwired, right? With energy, it cannot be on, on a kind of a, a, a loose kind of playing field. You know, as we're developing this program and, and, and hardwiring that connection to, to different countries, um, we, we have to have a very specific process, um, decision gates, not to overcomplicate it, um, but just the way that the process works within our industry. Um, what can I say? You know, I know everyone thinks that everyone's moving to clean tech. Um, it is a big push, um, but still, you know, we are all still focused on um, the current operational challenges, drilling the completions, um, hydrocarbon maturation, you know, reservoir efficiency. But we are working on clean tech as well, like wind, we're looking at hydrogen storage. Um, but all of these things go hand in hand, so it's not one or the other. Um, to tell you the truth, I'm trying to see what else I, I put in here. So if I go back real quick, I mean, so so we we're really working hard to try to forge these relationships. So besides working here locally with Rice, it's and and we'll work Greentown Labs because Jason was had one of the co-founders of Greentown, and he's now going full time, but he he actually had a clean tech startup. Um, is getting that cross-border exchange, right? Um, and, it, and it provides uh, either investment opportunities coming from those countries. So this past week, I've had a lot of conversation with Canadian VCs um, about the type of you know, investment opportunities they're looking for in energy companies, particularly in the US. Um, and also they're looking for someone to help de-risk and kind of re-risk their technologies in the U.S. market, right? So then they can either make later stage investments as well. So there are a lot of many different reasons why it's kind of important to kind of get these uh, kind of bridges put in place. And that's really kind of all, all I have right now. Um, but I would say, you know, there's a lot of unknowns in the, in, in the industry um, but it doesn't mean, you know, all of our, you know, especially we work very closely with HES, you know, they're, they're spending a lot of time, you know, and they have a, a, a centralized team from all across discipline. And, you know, we're all really looking at, you know, the concern is how do we keep the, you know, the fire alive um, during this time period, even though their budgets have been cut, they still, they have not dropped off any of their efforts, right? 
So it's looking at different ways of doing pilots, um, even on a, a smaller scale without even having to go to the field. So it's, it's really just starting with a clean slate to say, you know, can, can we have a different approach to some of this? I really like the, everything you're saying, and this is just such a wonderful presentation with, with so many things to consider. I'm glad we're recording it. <laughs> we could go back through and, and think about some of the things that you do. And, and I, I've actually um, worked with quite a few of the companies that you've worked with in, in the sense that, of you pitch. So mm -hmm. they participated, for example, Nash, they're going to be there mm -hmm. at um, you pitch next week. And they have a really interesting story. And I know that you've helped them a lot. Oh, I, I, like, I love their story, right? <laughs> we always look for stories, right? I mean, not like I'm looking, we're not, we're not looking to build unicorns, right? Um, right. We're just, we're looking for scalable um, companies that are going to address the industry's needs. Um, but I, you know, the reason why I like the story is because I think you have to understand why is someone doing this, right? Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing to do. You have to pivot a lot. It's tough. Most companies fail. Mm -hmm. um, it's stressful, right? Um, most of the larger company, I also, I come from a large company, but I've also worked in small and I have my own company, right? I'm not knowing what it's like. You know, you don't have a paycheck every day, right? You know, having to worry about your working capital. How are you going to pay your employees, right? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a daily challenge and struggle. Well, exactly. And one of the things that I've seen, and, and maybe uh, Brent has seen it as well, um, companies might have a, a, a really, really good concept, um, a, a new piece of equipment, a new innovation, and they, they actually get, they do the pilot test, they get it field tested, mm -hmm. it's, 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 and then there is time to have the order. And then mm -hmm. they fall down in the fact that they can't manufacture enough of the thing that they, they're trying to sell. And so it's like, how frustrating to not be able to scale, like it's a basically a scale issue. So. Yeah, and, and that's when it gets into, you know, finance people say, I'll worry about the finance stuff later, right? But, you know, you, don't, you really don't realize kind of, okay, okay great, you, you have a commercial contract. But when are you actually going to get paid, right? Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm an ex-shell person, and even, even earlier this year in Canada, you know, Shell Ventures said, yeah, you know, we hate to say this, but it's going to take you about six to nine months before we can pay you. We know that's bad. And so we understand why, you know, kind of the younger companies don't come to us. And so, you know, when we, we look at budgets and we look at companies say that they need funding, you know, most times we're like, that, that's just way too low. Um, because, you know, you're really not going to have any cash flow, even though you have a commercial contract in hand, you know, nine to 10 months later. And that's why we're also, you know, looking at the not, you know, not the VC route um, per se, but looking at family offices, you know, working right. with great organizations. Is there a different, you know, way we we can put a, a better funding mechanism um, for these companies as we de-risk de them with real customers through this process? Exactly, and that really is the key. That's wonderful because it's just there's nothing more frustrating than having all these orders that being undercapitalized and not being able to manufacture them. And I'll give it to the PPP. So I made sure like Nash went and got, and I'm like, you go get your PPP funds. <laughs> you know, they, they, you know, and it's also, it's startups getting good advice, you know, making sure that they knew like for they, cause they have a lot of, you know, they do have a full team that's on a payroll. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just two, two people. So, you know, there's R and D tax credits, you know, so they get R and D tax credits again, that gets applied against their payroll taxes that they have to pay. So it's, it's looking at all of these things, right. Mm -hmm. um, to make a smarter use of your funding and to extend that runway. The team also, I think took a little bit of a pay cut. They all decided together during this time period, you know, jointly to, to, to look at, let's stretch our budget right. as much as we can, um, just in case there's another you know, it's always good. To, and, yeah, it's a continuous plan. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's always a plan. Well, that's great. Well, well, thank you, Amy. This is really oh, wonderful and inspiring. 
So oh, we okay. always welcome people to join us, you know, we, we, we have to kind of forge our own path. So I said, it's very important for us in the industry to do it together with industry, um, with industry associations, with um, governments and trade organizations that, that are focused on, on the technology and innovation effort. You know, so the, the, this whole model is, is getting everyone to put some skin in the game. Right? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Susan. I know, thank you, this is mm -hmm. great. So, our, um, so now we have an example of a successful innovation and I'm really happy to be able to introduce Don Herman. I um, want to share your, open your, um, share your screen, open your, can turn on your camera. There we go. Great. Welcome. <laughs> it's Susan, thanks. I'm really excited. Uh, Don's with Cordex, and they have a new tool, and it says logging while um, drilling, and it's just so unique. And, and Don pr participated in UPitch about three years ago for the first time, and they've, they've really um, grown. So anyway, um, would you like to share some slides? Well, I appreciate the opportunity for this, Susan. I, uh, you know, being an oil field service company, it was weirdly encouraging for me tonight that I was stuck on the freeway and all these <laughs> trucks and cars were just creating demand for uh, oil. So it was good. <laughs> so I literally was about an hour and a half late or hour late. Do you mind showing the, the, the video presentation? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Don uh, recorded one for your tech last last week. So I need to try to find it in my okay. files. So it'll take me a second. So while uh, while he does, I do that. Does anybody have any questions for anybody? Um, anybody want to open up their? Um, so I guess I can ask, I have a question for um, Brent Kisling. Do Does Oklahoma have many accelerators? Whoops. Looks like Brent may be logged off. Oh, okay. Well, um, Larry, do you want to talk about the things that you've, you've looked at in um, strategic planning and how it applies to so you're wanting some filler, right? Were you? Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> no, I'm. Yeah, I'll talk. I'll talk for a minute. Uh, as I mentioned before, my one of my significant areas is strategic planning, and uh, it's important to go through the proper process to make that work. By the way, Susan, signal when you're ready to do your thing. Okay. Um, anyway. Uh, I was uh, I was talking to Susan earlier about uh, the situation that uh, has happened to us in our economy. I was doing some little research earlier. The unemployment rate in January in this country was uh, 3.6%. Uh, in June, it was 11.1%. Uh, the, uh, the GDP took a 35.5% uh, dip in the uh, in the last quarter. And uh, it's interesting to watch the what how, how companies are reacting. You know, Susan's title on this series is pivoting, which means being able to change direction. Unfortunately, it appears that a lot of companies are not able to. They're not diversified enough to change the direction, but some are. And there's some interesting stories out there about that. In fact, we picked up some of those stories in the presentations in this series, and so it's uh, it's pretty interesting. It's, it's also interesting for me to observe the politics of it all. We see the moaning and groaning of American Airlines. Uh, you know, just things are so tough for them. I saw they got a PPL of $5.8 billion. So that ought to help them to uh, fly for another day. And uh, anyway, that's a ramble, but some of my observations related to uh, the pivoting, some are able to do it, some are not able to do it. I think I mentioned before, I've got a friend who has a company who makes uh, fire protection equipment for different industries, the oil industry, for example, and, and other industries also. And that business essentially died and they got a contract of, you know, a few million dollars to make the mask of their primary function and the materials in the uh, clothing they were manufacturing was a sewing machine. 
and they adjusted their sewing machines to start making these uh, uh, these masks. And then one of the things you're looking to at the universities is still up in the air where there's whether there's Oklahoma Sooners and Texas Longhorns are going to get to play this year. But there's been some publicity that uh, if there are fans in the stadium, the uh, universities are going to provide uh, masks to the people who attend. Uh, certainly with their logos in this company, they're reaching out to uh, see if they can get contracts to, to process or make some of these uh, masks for universities and schools with the logos. So sometimes, you know, a, a pandemic or a national situation that we have, it provides some, it, it's, it's sad what happens to some companies, but it does provide some opportunities for others. So uh, those are some observations. Uh, Susan, are you ready with your Yeah, comment? that's good. Yeah, so I found the video. We, we, we actually recorded two of them. One is a longer version, another was a shorter one. Of course, I found the longer one, but I skipped a, over to the part where it gets really good. <laughs> so anyway, so I will share my screen somehow or unless I'm already sharing it. Let's see. Ah, it's a little bit challenging to do all these different screens. Um, let's see. I thought that I had it. Okay, great. I can share screen. Whoops. Alrighty. Um, okay, so I'll try not to mess it up here. 100 years ago to now we can do it very cost effectively and safely. Um, so kind of the whole notion of how we pivoted during the pandemic and, you know, the Initial application for Cortex was really an unconventional and, you know, long laterals where instead of geometrically um, designing a completion based on no data, you at least now have the ability to understand your geology. And our whole focus really during this downturn is how do we, how do we optimize our delivery system and really decrease the overall cost of data acquisition to the operators, which we have done a, a, a very good job of. Um, can you hear that? <laughs> um, so, you know, the couple of the major points to bring up, the methodology to optimize completion. We started out with a product called Zone Grader, which is really a formation analysis tool. Added Zone Tuner, which is more of a completion optimization. And now we've really added, um, what, what can we do with limited entry or extreme limited entry completions to help operators drive down their cost of completion? So it's geologically optimized limited entry completions. And it's something we've been working on for about three years and, and it's really taken off during this downturn. Um, Cost-wise, it's part of our, our package, so it's no additional cost. And we allow operators to really take the geologic data, understand how to make their completions better. And by better, how to reduce overall completion costs, maybe increase stage lengths and get the same number of clusters, which we're doing quite a bit of now. And we're seeing operators achieve 20% reductions and completion costs just by managing their, their stage lengths better. Um, we've also got some new applications that are being commercially introduced right now. Um, we got one, the CEL, which is a cluster effectiveness log. And to be totally candid, it's in field test right now. So it's not a commercial, uh, a commercial product yet. Um, we've got two wells. We're actually starting the first one tomorrow to validate the, the thesis, so to speak. And if we do this, instead of looking at, you know, million dollar fiber optic installations or very expensive micro seismic um, interpretations, 
we have a methodology for sub fifty thousand dollars to evaluate cluster effectiveness, which can help operators get better. And thesis being, if you improve cluster effectiveness, you have more clusters contributing flow, and you should get more production. Um, so it's not a complicated thing, but it's it's not easy to implement. So we've been doing a lot of development work, and we should have that. Uh, um, first results by the end of this week. So really the, the market focus for us being not a, a wireline truck has to go sit on a well for three days with a very efficient deployment system. So we basically, we, we service all basins um, and a lot of the wireline places in Oklahoma, the Rockies, Wyoming, Bakken have shuttered their business. We're still uh, we're still there to, to help operators out, and really the the notion is to service all types of wells, um, which you know the normal unconventional lateral application is well known, but we're also a very good wireline replacement in vertical wells, and uh, and really the the focus for us is lowering costs and improving production. So kind of summarizing it, it's, uh, it's a unique deployment to obtain something we've been doing as an industry for 100 years at a much lower cost point, much lower risk. Uh, for the first time in my life and in the business, drilling actually likes the logging operation now, and, uh, which is kind of a new thing. Um, and the reason is it's safe, and we, we had very, very little break time to their operation. So for unconventional, conventional, we're doing a lot of work in saltwater disposal wells, gas storage wells, um, entering a lot of enhanced soil recovery operations. And I guess the point is, you know, we have technology that operators can lock every well again if they choose. So I thank you for the time. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. This is quite interesting. And okay, well, <laughs> here we are. We don't need to see double, Susan. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, thank you. And, and I didn't capture the part where we had the, you can see the tool, but I think you get the idea and we'll have a, a we'll be able to have um, links to your, to your website, uh, Don. Perfect. Well, thank you, Susan. I'm glad we get to see the video in action. And uh, <laughs> I think the second time was better, so that's good. <laughs> but, but I do appreciate the time. And, uh, and really, the logging while tripping, in a nutshell, is it, it's a 100-year-old idea of logging welds that, in a way, died out. And now we have a way to do it again. And we can help operators save a lot of money on completions and not increase risk to their wealth. So I appreciate it. Well, that's great. So, well, we, um, we're, we're doing really well on time. So we have time for some questions from people in the audience and also a little bit of, of kind of reflection. Um, would anybody like to, to reflect on some of the things that, that we've talked about today. Oh, I may need to call on people. <laughs> so Sunil, I have a question for you. So as a person who started a, 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 an analytics company, what do you think is the biggest challenge? Uh, so at this stage, I would say, you know, um, my challenge is primarily because of the oil and gas industry downturn, right? So uh, before uh, COVID-19, the same downturn was actually working in favor of these analytic solutions because people were really looking at, let's say, improving their operational efficiency, um, improving the safety and, you know, reducing safety incidents and accidents, all of that they were looking for. Uh, at this stage, it's slightly different. The activity itself has just gone down completely. 
So, so that's I. I mean, I still see that as a temporary dip, but nevertheless, that's a challenge. And um, the other thing, uh, so on the positive side of things, I would still say that you know uh, there is still demand for these kind of solutions, especially the demand for analytics-based and big data-based solutions is continuously increasing. And also, we are seeing a great traction on the uh, renewable side of things. A lot of these technologies are exactly same. The techniques and tools that we are developing, right? They are exactly same on the renewable side. So we are seeing uh, some good traction on that side. Oh, that's quite interesting. So another question I have. Um, so that that's really helpful because I'm thinking about. I don't know if you're still on, Devin. I have a question for you about if I wanted to partner with an Israeli company, how do I get started? Um, actually, at any time, you can reach out to me or anyone in our group, and then we will put you in contact with whoever you're looking for. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, if I have a, a, an, an established business or even just a, have a startup, mm -hmm. we can come up with a business plan together and just... Um, just try it out? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we can talk after this. And anybody that you have in mind, uh, I'd be more than happy to get you in contact with. OK, great. That's really interesting. And I had a question for Amy, too. OK, so Amy, you said um, paid, um, paid pilots. How does that work? Oh, how does that work? Well, it's. Um because our legal agreement with our alliance partners is, um, we I mean, we but we do this a lot of the screening and and we do the pre vetting kind of the, we're kind of like the extension arm all the due diligence. But it's a joint discussion, you know, decision at the end of the day. And you know, if we decide to intake, then they agree to to provide a paid field trial, right? So you know, startup is not going to get their their commercial rate. Um, for you know their their field trial, but you know they'll get more than recovering their costs. You well, know they kind of get something something in between, and we've never had an had an issue. And it's also them looking at you know you know MSAs and and how do we get away from the 70, 80 page MSA mm -hmm. um, for early stage companies. So by our legal agreement, it, it's already agreed to that, you know, they don't, they can't and they don't take any IP from the companies. The startups are allowed to use their name. And then each of the, you know, and the thing is you have to have the people around the table that have the right mindset. And this is where I go to talk about the skin in the game. This is an active participation model. So, you know, each of them, you know, challenge each other from other companies and then they go within their own organizations. Um, and try to kind of push the envelope to see how do we, you know, can we do it better? So Nesh is an easy one. You know, typically Nesh would have started out with a typical 70, 80 page MSA if they did a field trial. Um, so the first one was structured with Equinor. So they ended up with a 10 to 12, 10 to 12 page uh, uh, agreement. And then Equinor actually shared the, the actual agreement with Hess. And so then Hess said, let's see what we can do to see if we can streamline it even more, right? But you have to have people at the table and with the right mindsets. It's still a process, right? It's still a challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's, you know, we work t together collectively. And then the, you know, the members work individually with their own organizations. Um, but these, you know, some of these small changes are really big changes um, for early stage and small companies. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, that's, that's really great because I, I do know of a few startups that would, they would get uh, field trials, but they basically didn't get paid at all. It's like the company said, well, okay, we get, you get to use our, our, uh, you know, our, our, our well <laughs> as a test well or whatever, which is fine, except that's where you, you're talking about starvation by ramen noodles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and the other the other big challenge we have, and and, and, and we do this as well because we're there, um, we'll sip the asset team because we're all from the energy industry, and we'll we'll help scope the business use case as well as the economics for that. So mm -hmm. you know we also push. I mean, it's like a, a push and pull. 
And we definitely put push our startups, but then we also have to push our, our operators too. Say, listen, I mean, you're gonna have to give us some data, right, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, because we, we, you're just gonna have to part with something in order to, for them to be able to develop a business use case, right? You say you want the technology, um, but you know, you're, you're gonna have to open it up here a little bit, right? Right. And so that's part of, part of what we do is, is, is help the startups as we're trying to scope this out, um, get some of this data that they normally would never be able to have, right? That, that will help foster and, and say, okay, we, they can say, okay, I have efficiencies, I'm going to improve, you know, production efficiency by X. But then, you know, through our alliance, we're working so that they can actually use some real data um, that is, is very scarce so that they can run it through whatever models they may have, right, to help validate that. And, and that also is extremely important. Well, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Well, um, so I see that Richard uh, Shu is in the audience. I don't know if you're willing to talk, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, Richard is a geophysicist mm -hmm. and he's done some innovative things. I was wondering if you ever faced any of the challenges that have been described today. Uh, hi, so uh, yeah, this is Richard. Uh, I haven't thought too much about that because uh, 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 Leaf Day is also pretty busy, uh, busy on work and also busy on, so also uh, on the SEG uh, kind of a, a volunteering work uh, for annual meeting for some uh, committee work. So. Uh, Still keep pretty busy. Um, I guess many people are probably the same way. They have more time to uh, to uh, uh, arrange by yourself, but also kind of cope up with uh, all uh, different things from different directions. Um, well, actually, I do have a question actually for today's talk. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can ask uh, a question for Devin. Um, so your uh, your commission is a representative of the uh, uh government in Houston. Do you have? I mean, now kind of a lot of people, a lot of things happening online. Uh, do you have uh, kind of a uh, online webinar or online uh, seminar or some? Uh, uh, meetings and uh, kind of a promote uh, the companies uh, over in Israel to uh, the, the company in, in here in the U.S. Uh, periodically. Uh, Devin, is there? <laughs> <laughs> well, me is today. Hi, this, can you hear me? This is David. Hey, yes, thank you. I, I can answer that. Uh, yeah, this is David E. from I work with Devin in Houston at the Israeli Mission. Uh, basically, the way it, yes, I guess the short answer is yes, we do. The way it generally works is we'll go to a, a larger company that may be interested in some particular uh, focus area. It might be sensors, it might be robotics, it might be visualization, it could be cyber. You know, pick your poison. And once we've identified what their particular focus is, we will go ahead to the Israeli infrastructure and we're linked in to the Innovation Authority, the Export Institute, all the large organizations that kind of coalesce the uh, Israeli startups. And really, I say startups, but it's, it's a whole spectrum from startups to fairly mature entities. And we'll put together a slate of appropriate companies for that company to talk to and we'll run a, run a webinar on their behalf. So we, that's what we've been doing. It's actually been sort of our main modus operandi of the last month or two. But yeah, that, that's largely our function. As you said, we're a, a, a government entity. We don't have a horse in the race in, you know, in, in respect to this particular company. But we just try and facilitate relationships between Israeli businesses and U.S. businesses. And that's really all we do. Oh, that's great. That, that's a really good answer. That's really helpful, David. Really appreciate it. 
Yeah, now as far as this group goes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a long 35-some-odd-year uh, APG member, old oil and gas guy. Yay. And, Good and, for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really now with, you know, Israel does have, a, you know, an oil and gas landscape, but, you know, it's a bit quiet now in terms of new business. And we've pivoted very much to these sort of overarching technologies. So what I've been learning, and I, and I hope what a lot of our membership is learning through participation in these seminars, is that so much of the tech is overlapping. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the sensor technology that's used in water treatment in Israel, which is, you know, so cutting edge, very much is applicable to downhole applications or pipeline applications. Oh, that's same, super interesting. Same, same is true of visualization technology, of AI technology. So, so many of the things that before may have been more tailored to things that, that Israel is more uh, aimed at, known for, actually crosses the bridge. And you know, again, that's this pivoting issue that you're trying to target. So that's why we're becoming more involved in this series, and I'm, I'm hoping other folks are seeing the same synergies that we are. I think they do. I mean, there's a lot of, um, and it, what, last week, was it last week or the week before, we talked about industry crossovers, and there are so many. And, 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 they, and I mean, what you mentioned today was like, oh, wow, some new ones that I hadn't even thought about. So it's very exciting. Yeah, and I guess now, you know, it's, become, it's becoming more mainstream as, you know, Israel is a well-known leader in, uh, in solar and renewables. Mm -hmm. well, so, many, so many of the large energy companies, be it Shell or Exxon, are putting so much more resource into that, into that area that, again, it, it, it's becoming, it's not just overlap, it's a direct link. So we, we expect to become more and more mainstream, if you will, of the energy industry than we were just with some large gas fields offshore in the past. Right. And one of the things that, that um, and feel free to turn on your camera if you want to, but um, one of the things that I found to be really interesting about, um, about some of our upcoming um, programs that they have to do with um, battery technology and um, critical minerals. And, and so I'm excited that Israel has some, some things <laughs> that's for, for that as well. And we have, there's so much capability, so much interest. I think we might dedicate two weeks to that because that's just, just an amazing, amazingly important area. I'm going to interject here quickly, Susan, but I, cause oh, yeah. I, I think, I think we have all got to, and I'm also exiled. See, I'm ex shell. Um, and, and part of that, my job was, you know, of course, ex TV, but then also looking at how we develop technology and R and D in the labs and looking at different models and, and, and why do the IOCs have such a hard time commercializing on a full scale basis? You know, I, I think they're great. Shell Game Changer is a great program. That's a both internal and external focused. Mm -hmm. Um, but then again, those teams don't, aren't fully dedicated per se. Um, but people have to, you know, step, step back and remember that IOCs are an integrated value chain. They're structured the way they are for a certain reason, right? And, you know, they do have, you know, the budgets and they do spend a lot of time on the technology and innovation. But they are not going to be the ones that are going to be, you know, your, your really rapid early adopters at the end of the day. You know, if you, if you look at, you know, Shell's process, Chevron's, all of those. You know, it can take you sometimes two, three years to get through those programs. And, you know, we, we sometimes will, will pick up companies. Um, one of them that we work with right now is, is with Shell and Shell Game Changer, and they, and they graduated, and, and we, we continue to, to work with a lot of those Shell companies, is they may have to wait around for nine months, 10 months, 12 months to find an asset in which to do a POC, right? Mm -hmm. So there's pros and cons. Um, but then again, we have to also then work with the startups. Yeah, those might be your later stage companies, right? So time and time again, we see startups 
you know, running in circles. But I've been talking to Chevron for a year. Or I've been talking to yeah. Exxon for a year, right? And, you know, we still have to remember that, you know, they have those governance structures for, for a reason with their value chain. And so, you know, I, we've got to look at both sides of that, that equation, you know. That's a really good point. Plus, anything that they do has to go through so many levels of legal mm -hmm. that becomes challenging yeah. as well. Yeah. But we still partner work with them. I mean, we do. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not, it's not going to be on the, you know, on, on the very early stuff, right? Right. Um, it's going to be, we, we collaborate with them and we collaborate with them outside of our model and with some of our other partners because they also work closely. Um, same way with Technip, you know, they're a large technology service provider to, to the majors and, and to the likes of Hess and, and Equinor who are a little bit smaller, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be able to run things parallel knowing how those processes work, right? Right. Yeah, this is Richard again. Uh, uh, David, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing that uh, uh, information. I just wonder, also talk with uh, uh, Susan, like uh, uh, maybe you can uh, share that either web web link or some uh, little bit detailed information uh, can uh, have idea like uh, what time you guys have some seminars or webinars. Uh, maybe uh, like more audience will be interested to that because most of us uh, has a background of uh, uh, energy, either traditional energy, also uh, the renewable energy. So that will be, I think that will be really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Well, it looks like we're, we're about out of time. I just wanted, I don't know if you could hear there's some, some, like bird attack going on outside. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, <laughs> that's I'm very curious. I think there's a hawk attacking something. Anyway, so um, I don't want to, to use that as a metaphor for anything. So <laughs> let's just think about how we'll fly out of the nest and but not be attacked by hawks. And, <laughs> and think about how accelerators can protect us and how we can partner with different companies and think about things in different ways and new applications. I just love tonight's presentations. They were so inspiring and, and, there's, and also that there's funding available. That, that's useful too. I really appreciate Brent Kisling's um, information as well. So thank you again to Brent Kisling and Devin Reeves and Amy Henry, Don Herman, and thank you also for David to David Ephraim and and Richard Shu and Sunil Agar for for um, participating too, jumping in there. And then finally, the last word I'd like to give, as usual, to Larry Davis. Any final thoughts? Oh, I enjoyed the presentation, that, but I don't have anything to offer. I need to be brief so you can go out there and see what's happening with your birds. <laughs> Okay. Hey, thanks, Susan. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I hope you feel better soon. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. And you'll be receiving an email in, in, a, in a few days with links and information. Also information about next week's, which will be exciting. And, and even if you don't have a chance to attend, go ahead and sign up because you'll be able to watch the recording. Um, the, the recordings are getting quite a bit of of uh, quite a few viewers, which is good. So thanks again and have a nice evening. Have a good night. Bye bye. Thank you, Mike. Thank bye. you, Susan. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks.